A billion years ago, a massive volcano violently erupted in the Lesotho Mountains, bringing to the surface a rare type of magma, rich in gemstones. Over the course of time, diamonds were scattered into the river valley below. This river has never been prospected, until now. A group of top international businessmen, led by entrepreneur and adventurer Peter Jago, have secured this sought-after concession. They must journey to the roof of Africa and set up the world's highest alluvial diamond mining operation with the hope of unearthing the biggest diamonds ever found. Will they succeed in this ultimate high-risk, high-reward adventure, or will they be defeated by the harsh terrain and near-impossible challenges of mining in the mountains? I do believe one thing very, very strongly. If you dream it, do it. I am a risk taker. There's certain traits I fail in. That's why I've got partners. Once the lure of the diamond is in your blood, it's always there. None of us have ever done any mining whatsoever. I'm not the little angel here. I am a little hard ass. My aim is to find diamonds, find diamonds and retire. If you can feel pain, you're still human, you're still alive. I think it's going to be insane, literally, to dig for diamonds. The dream probably started about 36 years ago. I was a kid joined a diamond cutting factory and I learned to cut diamonds. And we weren't really making much money, so we decided we'd go and open a diamond cutting factory in Lesotho. And we ended up buying diamonds in the mountains. And that was always my dream. I always thought, you know what? One day, when I got the time, the inclination, and the ability to get a license, which is a huge issue, I'll come back. A decade after first applying for a mining license, Peter has gathered investors in Durban, South Africa. Eventually, license came. There's the claim lines. The claim area is directly adjacent to Letsiang Mine. This is very expensive. It's dynamite, huge trucks, crushing plants. They're taking out six and a half million tons a year. We don't have to do any of that. The elements have done it for us. We're going to go look for holes. We're going to look for rapids. We're going to look for anything that might have trapped stuff. Everything logical says it's there. It doesn't mean it's there. With, with diamonds, it's just sheer risk. It's like looking for a bloody needle in a haystack. My partners were very skeptical, didn't want to spend a penny, and that was a big issue. It's not an investment, that it's a pure gamble. The road that goes down there was only cut about five, six years ago. Before that, you went down on horseback. Nobody's physically done it. Just nobody's done Why it. Why do we yet. know that? We know, we do know. The government have never licensed anybody. And of course, they scoffed and said, are you out of your mind? Anyway, I persisted. Let's say is unique. They've taken five of the world's 20 biggest diamonds out of there. In history, star of the Sutu, a spectacular white diamond of 123 carats, was recovered in October 2004. We might discover the little honeypot. Yeah, there it all is, the whole and there's 50 diamonds in there, we get them all. I just know that I was ambushed, swept up with, it, with a hype. I'd go to my grave with, in tears if we hadn't tried this. <laughs> I would, I would. So I think we gotta take the risk, we gotta go, we gotta go see what's there. Well, got to. It's done. I've spent all your money, including my own. So <laughs> at least that way, we all know what we've thrown our money away for. <laughs> An adventure. Not a simple process of saying, oh, we got a license in April, let's go mining in May. There's an enormous amount of logistical work, planning, thought, that has to go into a project like this. If we take this trailer, we flip it over, and we put it on top there. It was a nightmare of logistics. I had to think of everything. Seven vehicles, seven trailers, plus a huge truck is going to join us tomorrow. We're going to pick up big diamonds. Big. So we need a big lift for the big diamonds. Everything from a trailer to bring your diesel and your water here. If you fill them, they weigh an 80 tons. And these vehicles are only like 1.5 tons. If you half fill them, it's even worse. Because when you go around a corner, it sloshes and the whole trailer will flip over. No one wants to go to Lesotho at 80 k's now. Not me. I only do 80 on my way to 150. <laughs> Conrad's a very wealthy man. Conrad made a lot of money. He's a very good logistics guy. And you know what? He'll roll up his sleeves and do anything. I've known Kim all my life. He's one of those solid guys. You can just sell him, do something, and he will get on with it. I was surprised when Peter said the license has come through. You don't want to get you and get locked up. Rob Thunder, the investor with the most to lose, can only join them a month into the expedition. The poorest investor in the mine, so it's very important for the mine to be successful. We had to find divers. 
Divers can be different people. They have a bad past, but this is my opportunity to shine and start living a normal life again. I'm an adrenaline junkie and I'm just me. <laughs> Most people will dream, but never do it. They'll sit and dream it and sit at their desk and slowly their lives disappear. I do not do that. With all the equipment and gear the team have to transport, it'll take two days to get to Lesotho. Don, my partner, he's your old school gentleman. He said, geez, no, he wants to come. You know, he's been through a very hard patch. I lost my wife to cancer last year. So all the other things I'd planned don't really mean much anymore. So this, in a sense, is a way to maybe get a bit of a bit of spark back in my life. A bunch of guys together, no electricity, no telephones. We still don't know how we're going to feed everybody. We're coming up here into an area with absolutely nothing. You have to think of everything. 17,300 rands worth of fuel. We just keep going till it's full. We're feeding 10 to 15 people three times a day. So that's 45 meals a day. So it's, it's quite a big ask in an area like this. There's no meat. Is it possible to buy goat somewhere up in the mountains and slaughter them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can just... <laughs> get a bit bored. Something like this where it's something different all the time. It's much better. That's why I've left my business to come into this. A lot of dust, but I think that's better than having it wet. The gravel smooths out the corrugations, yeah, but it does tend to be very slippery. This is like ball bearings. Yeah. Kim, Peter's cousin, is in remission from cancer, and he seizes the opportunity to go on this extreme adventure. Over that next ridge is the Letzing Mine. And then we're about 12 k's further on. In the mid-2000s, gem mines opened up Let's Say. And what I always knew was there came to light, the huge diamonds. And they continue to find huge diamonds and very special diamonds. A couple of months ago, found a little 12 carat blue diamond. They got seven and a half million dollars for that one stone. We just got to find one of those. The problem with Let's Say is they have to move an enormous amount of ground. Those are 50 ton trucks you see there. I would say those rocks are about the size of this bloody bucky. See the sheer walls? Okay. That's volcano. Diamonds are formed in a volcano. Pressure and heat causes pure carbon, which is coal, to turn into a diamond. Kimberlite, also called blue ground, is the diamond bearing rock that is brought to the surface by eruptions. Over millions of years, this has eroded and has been washed into the valleys below. And this is probably the best tributary off of Letang, this one here and it's vertical all the way, which means everything that goes down there goes to the bottom. It's not gonna stay halfway. When that snow melts and it rains hard, that water's just gonna go down there like a bullet. And you can see how sharply it's cut over the years. That bottom where that little village is, that's the right spot to be pumping. That's where the old lady dug holes and got diamonds in the hole. Peter hopes to set up here soon, but the village is remote. We're in the valley over the top of that hill. They will begin operations in the adjacent valley, which has a road in and accommodations for the team. I think if this was easy to get to, you'd have had a thousand guys here a hundred years ago. It's the weirdest feeling to think that you're parking right on top of diamonds. Now you start looking, picking, you're thinking you're going to walk past a diamond and become the most famous guy in the world. That's the objective. That's mine, of course. <laughs> yeah, circling a bit with the clutch, eh? Slowly, probably first gear, because you've got to see this, is, this yeah. is a bit more heavy than we've been on, eh? Keep it in second. These just... bulldozers that you can see, so thank God, I would think first even. A big risk is getting in and out of the valley. Really, really is. The road into the valley drops over 1,000 feet in just nine kilometers. What I knew from the very beginning is that coming into Lesotho here, we are coming into a hostile terrain. The roads are treacherous. The risks on the journey are, are real. I mean, these drop-offs here are pretty horrific. Sheer, and there are no barriers on the sides. Just concerned about one of the vehicles maybe getting pushed over by the heavy trailer. Once you start there, there's no stopping. Once you're over, you're over. I've got the heaviest load. 
which everyone was too worried about towing. It's like two tons of fuel. I mean, if you had to actually jam on the anchors now, it would slide either or, but just give Peter a bit of a space so he can go a bit. Off he goes, he like pretty much disappears. It's terrifying, it's actually terrifying. Bumpy patches. Two, three hundred foot drops off on one side, and once you lose control, you just better remember your prayers. Probably the scariest thing I've done for a long time. I was scared. I thought I said to myself, that's the wrong, wrong time to be afraid of height. Come on, don't, don't stop, man, go. The little stones are like a ball bearing. And every now and again, you can just feel the back of your car wanting to pass you. If you come down there, you will die. That car will go off the edge of the cliff, and you will die. I promise you, nearly the dead three times. First, <laughs> I started sliding. I jumped out, handbrake on, I had to jump to grab rocks and put it behind the wheels. Big black scorpion this size under that rock. I got such a fright that I was more worried about my bucky uh, sliding off the cliff. I think there were times there where I was pretty damn worried. And we were at high risk a lot of times there. The lodge where they will be staying has no electricity or running water and the nearest hospital is a half a day's drive away. Well, everybody, we're here. This is the place we're going to base ourselves for the next nine weeks. This is stunning country. It's medieval. These people are subsistence farmers. They farm sheep. They use the cattle to plough. And they, they plant. They don't sell it out of this area. It's all for the area. Tabo, a Lesotho advocate, arranged their stay in this remote community. You don't come to a place like this without talking first to the chief. You should always have a diplomatic approach. Tabo has employed local graduate John to help with daily operations. We had to use locals. All countries don't want foreigners coming in and bringing their own staff. What did you graduate in? In Vicomo County. Ah, OK. Yes. So you got the, the guy who's going to count the diamonds in case we steal them. <laughs> is that it? No, no. <laughs> We've got all the machines. The river's got water in, which is a great thing, thank God. This afternoon, we'll take down the jig. We'll take down one of the pacifiers, stick it on the river, and start pumping. I believe that Peter is going to be able to get good diamonds around this area. If he doesn't, I can place my head on the block. <laughs> These guys want to go down to the river and just do a recce. The plan was to look to see where diamonds may have fallen into pools and pockets deep enough so that once they've settled, they won't be shifted. Find three or four spots and mine them intensively. Bit of a mission getting the machines down to the river. This is very, 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 very rocky terrain. Everything is very steep, very rocky, quite dangerous. Starting that side, my concern is the slope. So there's the other choice, Don, up there. But every easy route they find uh, is through a farmer's field. Uh, yeah, this is a fabulous spot. I mean, look at the salt. But we need to set up on that bank, which means coming from down those plowed lands. That's a bit of a bugger, eh? Okay, we found a spot. There's a soccer field. You go straight out and right up to the water. The headman doesn't want us to go through his field. Yeah, then. So there's another way. There's another way. We'll show you. I think these people, when we first came in, were dreading us coming in. Yeah, here comes another bunch of mining people who are going to bugger up our valley and ruin our lifestyle, especially the older folk. They look at you with disdain and think, oh, geez, yeah, these idiots are going to come mess our river up. So the machines will have to wait. Right now, the miners need to focus on public relations. Head of the, the village next door to us told us we can come and get a goat and a sheep. He said it was five minutes away, but that was uh, half an hour ago. About you coming here, the, the, the mixed emotions. We need to understand what, what we're allowed to do and not allowed to do. Some of them are still worried. I'd already told the environmental guys in the city that I wouldn't mess up their river. But Peter still has to convince the workforce. Okay. We suck the sand from the river and we take it out onto the bank and then we put it down and it runs back. It doesn't mess up the water. It doesn't mess up anything. No chemicals, no crushing, no breaking, nothing. Just vacuum. All right, so tomorrow morning what we're going to do is we're going to get all together with one machine. He's going to set up one machine on the river so we know how to work it. 
And as soon as everybody can see how it works and everybody's used to it, then we're going to split into two groups. It's, it's not hard work, but it's long. I wonder if these are them. Yeah, they are, John. Thank you very much. Who's going to slaughter them? No, uh, we will do it. I think I should renegotiate it. <laughs> I think it's a pygmy goat. <laughs> yeah. My goodness gracious. It's not going to feed anybody. Maybe 350. 350. Yes. Is that good? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Some of the people who live here, they live in poverty. So I think that's a, a very big opportunity. By buying the, the sheep from them, yeah, it shows them that we are here for no harm. They're happy, we're happy. Remember, we got no food. <laughs> they got no money. Great, great partnership. They have so little. When you get out here amongst the, the local community, it makes you aware that we're all totally spoiled. It doesn't matter who we are in, the, in, in our modern society. We're a throwaway society. Here, people have time. You get to know them. They greet you, they stop, they want to know who you are, where you come from. They're genuinely decent people. This has been an incredible experience. Peter's talk has satisfied the locals, and he's found a route down to the water. You come around where the field is plowed, go through that, that silt, across onto that bank. They would prefer to be in the adjacent valley, where an elderly woman is believed to have found a large diamond. But right now, it's all they can reach. It's also a chance to test the machines. I think the first machine should set up right here. Let's go. Yeah. It's too late for the machines today, but at least everyone is happy, except for the sheep. I know my Irish partner thinks it's easier to find a four-leaf clover. <laughs> this river's run through here for a billion years. It's got to be down there. And I think we're going to fly. I think we're going to pump diamonds out of there like all hell. Today, breakfast for everybody. Then what we're going to do, get the machines, get them down to the water as soon as possible, start pumping sand. Jan, the manufacturer of the machines, is the only guy who knows how these machines work. We manufacture alluvial diamond mining equipment. I'm not sure that the equipment is the right equipment. Our equipment comes from a supplier who supplies into the DRC. The type of alluvial diamond mining there is completely different. We're going to have to use the JCB to probably pull roads through, but we're going to get it in this morning. We can't wait. When we're pumping sand, chances are high of finding something, so we have to get down there this morning. So we've found three spots. We're off for the easiest to access. A bit of road work to the other two spots. I would have actually liked to have tested these machines before we even brought them up here. If you didn't want to fiddle with anything until the manufacturer they handed them over to us and said, right, they're working. Even the easy site is proving hard to access. So close to pumping, I don't want to break anything now. It's a mission. I never anticipated it to be easy. It's a big, huge mission. We can start pumping over there by the rocks. Manhandle it down there. You think you're going to manhandle this thing? You can't pick this up. You'll have to manhandle it by hand. The river itself comes down in flood regularly after the snow and after big rain. And when a river moves quickly, it has a vibrating effect. The analogy of the popcorn, if you take a bag of popcorn and you put the marble on top and you hold it dead still, nothing will happen. But the minute you do this, that marble will go straight down to the bottom. The same with the diamond in the river. You can't pan this, you'll never find anything. The diamonds are at the bottom. So it's a matter of sucking down to bedrock, getting into the cracks, and then you're gonna find something. The water temperature is just above freezing, which doesn't seem to deter the divers. I think it's all about the adventure right now. Conditions, well, it's not ideal. The water's not very high, but typical diamond-bearing gravel. Let's hope they get some diamonds here. But these machines have yet to be tested. My plan is basically to explain how the system works, and that's it. After that, I'm back to Cape Town and on to the next project. That customer's in Angola that found one spot they put 20 different pumps into one hole and they were all taking a diamond. There's no suction from the pump. After transporting the equipment for two days, 
and setting it up in the remote valley. Jan's mining equipment doesn't work. We paid millions for that equipment. We've got loads at stake. I've basically put all my eggs in one basket. I've resigned and for me it's make or break. Uh. By now I had full visions of having some sort of stone in my hand. It's day three in the remote Lesotho mountains, and the equipment hasn't processed a single stone. Kim is towing the second classifier from the lodge to see if the problem is just a faulty pump. The next station we're going to is going to need a bit of road work, so hopefully while we're doing that, Jan can strip this other pump down and have a look and see if it's repairable. I think my optimism is a slightly dented. We've risked three and a half million. That's our risk. You have to come up here and find out that a pump doesn't work 10,000 feet like it does at the ocean. I suppose any startup is difficult, especially as not one single one of us had any idea what we were doing. There was just no drive in the pumps because of the altitude. We brought the manufacturer along with us. He found out that the mistakes were his. Pumped a bit of water, still not pumping the way it should have. We need more force in the pump, and we need more force on the suction to be able to suck the gravel up. At the moment, it doesn't hardly want to suck the water. The locals are fascinated. Rich playboys coming around here, scratching around in the waters and, uh, and the sand. They're keeping a close watch on us. And they're not the only ones. Kim has had a run-in with a spy. On my way back here, let's say one vehicle stopped right in the middle of the road, and then he realized that it was too late, he'd been seen. So he, he kept coming. He wants to know, what's the lodge like? More than likely stayed there more times than we have. For all the machineries in one place that the security yeah. can look after. We have heard that it is quite dangerous down here. You're sitting ducks, aren't you? People know we're here, and they know what we're doing here. And all of that adds risk. The local people, I don't believe, are a security risk to us. These are passive, very nice people. Where can we organize somebody to stay overnight security? Where we have a major risk is outside of these areas, more in the smaller towns, you do get the totsies, the criminal. They're on the constant lookout for anything like this. Up here, there's no such fantasy as a credit card machine or an ATM. You've got to carry cash, and if a truckload of these guys come in, four or five of them with AK-47s. There's no way in this world you're going to defend yourself against that. That's why he has a guard on the gate with a shotgun who will use it. While the machines are inactive, roads need to be built to access sites in the next valley. The divers are frustrated. We're meant to get the guys going with some spades and buckets at least, start working this bank down a bit. Three guys with bloody buckets scooping could have found a biggie and we could have all been going home. <laughs> Everyone agreed with it last night, so it was a good idea. Even the guy who made the machine said it's a brilliant idea. Um, and then today, all the sardines, they seem to think that no, it's not a good idea anymore. So now we're going to fuck up the whole day by building roads. The divers, being typical macho young men, everything is possible. Just got to get the hang of this thing. I'm not a TLB driver. It's just finding out exactly where things are, that's all. I'm that kind of guy, I mean, I've jumped around the world, and this is the kind of stuff I need. I just have to be totally stimulated all the time. Something new every day, and it's a learning curve, and that's what I enjoy. Warren? I think bad luck follows him. Make my hair stand up. Huh? Why does, why does he always have to go that extra half meter? My hair's falling out as it is. I had a bit of an incident where the side of the bank actually just broke away. The TLB is basically falling over. Oh. The guys are screaming, this one's saying up, that one's saying down. You know, we have never gone over the sheer dangers. 
And maybe because we didn't want to, you want to kind of set them out of your mind and you just want to get on with the job. That was a little bit hair-raising. It's just the weight of one guy, Kim, standing on the other side of the TLB, who actually held it upright without it falling over. Managed to pull the back arm across, leaned it on. It's terrifying. That fucking machine is absolutely terrifying. I do feel a bit intimidated. You don't know what to expect. Warren's amateur driving experience has punctured a tire and frayed some nerves. Conrad will be taking over the TLB. If it goes down, um, the eight pickaxes we bought may not be sufficient. <laughs> I'm on my way now to our first site. Jan's down there today. He got there, I think, about five o'clock this morning. So I'm super excited. At least get some, you know, start doing, get some progress going. Check, Gary. He's starting that thing up. That's promising. That's awesome. His pumps are supposed to pump 16 meters of head. We couldn't get 16 inches of head. So my suggestion right now is we take the pump and the classifier off the trailer, put them on the ground. And then we see, I'm 99.999% certain it's gonna pump like hell when it's on the ground. Are we ready? Let's go. Let's go. The whole point of having it on the trailer is so that in the event of a flash flood, we can, we can pull the equipment out quick enough that we don't run any risks of loss. Big risk to the equipment. We said to him, please supply us what we need for a purpose. And he's the expert, he's been doing this for 30 years. It should have 30 meters of hose on it. It can stand up here on the bank, pump from down there. That's what it's designed to do. We're here to, uh, to find diamonds with his equipment. And if we don't say anything now, the failure won't be his, it'll be ours. While Jan sets up the machines inches away from the water, Conrad tries to convince Don to step in. The problem I have is we can never go to places which are probably geographically perfect for alluvial diamonds because you can't get your equipment in. It means we're completely compromised. Yeah. This guy operates on the coast, sea level. We've wandered into this with no experience. We've depended on him, so let's give him the opportunity to prove himself wrong. If he proves himself wrong, then we can look at another solution. Jan's right about one thing. On the ground, the classifier does work. The machine is now working. The diamonds have been spat into that bag there faster than you can see. Rocks. Just rocks. Lots of little rocks. I think we're, uh, we're doing as well as can be expected for first time, first time adventurers. The method we use for extracting the diamonds out of the river is a very simple method. It is um, based on a wet vacuum cleaner. Diver holds the nozzle into the silt. It sucks silt and water through the four inch line into a pump. That pump then pushes it into a classifier. A classifier is a, a rotating sieve. You pump the sand in one end and the mud falls out the beginning and it goes through various sizes of sieve until it comes out the other end, big rocks fall out and you end up with a whole lot of different grades of sizing. With it down on the ground like that, it's hard to handle the bags. I think we've got enough now, I think we can start testing out the jig as well. You will take those classified sizes and put them in a jig. It works again on a type of gravity, the water is moved up and down and what happens is all the light material moves slowly off the top of the jig and falls off the end and the diamonds get trapped in the boxes in the jig. Steady, go. Again, one, two, three, go. One, two, three, go. The specific gravity or the SG of a diamond is substantially heavier than most other stones. So the diamond will immediately go to the bottom and gets trapped in the bottom of those boxes and that's where you'll find it. Today's fun. I've never seen a rough diamond. So I'm really the wrong guy to, to head up a diamond exploration team because I don't know what I'm looking for. I haven't got a clue. I saw that too. It's the eyes playing tricks on us. See the green? 
there's only two experts in this team. Number one is Pete. Green Garnet, you always find in the volcanic pot. His cousin Kim, I think, has a, a bit of knowledge. Let me just see. It is illegal to buy diamonds without a license. But now that the locals trust Peter, they're bringing their treasures for him to identify. No, it's crystal, my mate. I think it's still crystal, eh? I don't think you've got diamonds. With a diamond, it's got a little triangle like this. Next time you can look properly and you can see what you've got. Looks like the Lusitu Air Force. It seems the Let's Sing mine has taken an interest in them as well. It was actually scary. We thought they're going to try and trap us. They're going to send people with pieces of glass to sell to us. They're going to video us. Uh, and we saw lots of their vehicles around almost every day, parked at a distance, parked up there, up the mountain, parked at our gate, and they got quite shirty when we chased them away. Nothing yet, but the presence of garnets often found alongside diamonds is a promising sign. Finally, they bag stones. We go to that sorting table up there at the bra, and then that's where we'll go through it and sort through there. Don't you come help me, please? But the bags will have to wait. There's a problem. The police came sprinting down here in their four-wheel drives with their AK-47s and harassed the hell out of our guard, and then eventually got in and harassed the hell out of us. A bunch of guys come in with AK-47s thinking we're a bunch of crooks. Who are you? What are you doing here? What do you, you know, you know diamonds is illegal. You don't speak their language, they don't speak yours. It's a tiny little push before they pull the trigger, eh? It doesn't take much to get them to go. Deep in the Lesotho Mountains, armed police have swooped in and put a stop to mining operations. I was very concerned. It got very, 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 very touchy for a while there. It was literally, you guys are stealing out of our valley. We're going to lock you up now. You don't want to end up in a, in a Lesotho jail. I said, we are licensed. Tabu, our host, is a, is a local advocate. He translated everything. And once we had the translation going, it became a lot more friendly, and that's when they said, look, if you guys have problems, we're available, and we will come and help you. Their new friends also warned them about the coming rains. I did bring huge covers. You just chuck rocks on the corners, and they cover all of them. He just said to us, be quite careful. Make sure your stuff is above the water line. I don't want the water to come down here like a bullet, and we lose all our machinery. I mean, that then we've done everything for nothing. There's water everywhere, but none of it safe to drink. We didn't think that we'd have to fight for water, but that just goes to show you come to some place so remote. Even our situation is 10 times better than the guys living in the village across the way. Our tap opens, it's empty, but they can't even open a tap. <laughs> oh my. The water the team brought in is finished. They have been given permission by the chief to fill up their tank from the local spring. The fountain of life, we found it. <laughs> Certainly for us for the next 10 weeks. Go. Yeah, rest it on the tank. Go behind there. Put it behind. Yeah, there. Lift it up higher. Another Heath Robertson, and it works perfectly. We are a small population of 1.8 million people. Our number has been reduced due to HIV and AIDS. As a result of the AIDS pandemic, many households here are now headed up by children. Hey, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> this community relies on no one but itself. My head, look at that balance. Look at that balance. I've just come back from three and a half months in Ireland, and the people were all complaining that uh, the government now wants to meter their water and charge them a paltry sum for supplying them with clean, fresh drinking water. And when you look at what people out here have to go Can't through angle, just eh? to get water, but we leave someone here. It makes you very, very humble. If he comes any closer, he's going to be dinner on Tuesday. Down at the river, everyone is hard at work. I'm so impressed with the character of the people here and they have nothing. This valley has absolutely no employment, and we're creating employment. I, for one, I'll be putting food on the table, so yeah, it's, it's a good thing. These local Basudu guys are learning the machines, and they're quite capable already. Every single guy is pulling his weight. Every single guy is trying his best. Working up a sweat, just getting changed. The divers have to modify their wetsuits for the extreme conditions. But we've got a safety word, hey? Yeah. In case you get into trouble. Oh, fuck. <laughs> My plan was to have Kim to really manage 
one crew, a diver, and a bunch of Basutu guys. Conrad then took on the role of manager of the second team. We've set up our teams, so there is, there is two teams. There's an A team, there's a B team. It's a team of nature to compete. The machines are now working overtime, and Warren's rig is overflowing. Your machine is bulls up, running right through, overflowed right through till the last gate. So they've got smalls all the way through. I have big pumps when you can't fucking pump. It's fun to compete, it keeps the vibe going to an extent, but then yeah, if it gets a bit out of hand, which it does, and I'm sure it will out here. We're gonna sit and pump and then wait five minutes, and then sit and pump and then wait five minutes. Because that first sieve is too small. Kim, we're gonna change this mesh. That's what we want, and that's what we don't want. We don't want this fine stuff, it's just wasting time and making the guys work a hundred times harder. You see that for the conga in those areas is beautiful because it lets the mud through. Yeah, yeah. But here we got no mud. Yeah. Yeah. Jan is unable to make any further improvements to the machines while he is here. He's returning to South Africa to build bigger pumps and source wider mesh for the classifiers. Thank you very much. And I will be back soon. A week, when two the weeks. Pumps come, I'll come up. Everything has taken three times longer than we thought. Every single thing we do, from washing your hands, is a mission. You have to figure it out. But uh, you know what? We're going to find these diamonds. They are here. You know, when every single person around you is, is, knows that it exists, all you've got to do is we just got to keep going until we find it. Until then, the machines are vulnerable, and the weather is not in their favor. Look at this, this is amazing. It's snowing in October. <laughs> this is crazy. So, now it's clearing up up there, look at that. Looks like it's thick up there. Eh? This is Africa at its best and worst. It's hostile. It's just different. You get four seasons in one day. By midday there's hailstones and a cloud that just looks as though the devil moved in on top of you and lightning all around you, and this is high. This snowfall is making the locals very nervous. So it can be washed away by the river. Let's take all the guys, we take the machine out the water. I don't think it's gonna catch us until late tonight. Maybe we just work till lunchtime and then load them. We've been warned by the locals that if you get a lot of rain or the snow melt, the potential is this river can get very high and very fast, and it will take our machines downstream. Right now, it's already melted 50%. The equipment's right on the edge of the river. Without our gear, we might as well pack up and go home. But right now, we're not even at bedrock. So this morning, the idea is run the two pumps for the morning, then at lunchtime, lift the gear onto high ground, which is a mission in itself. Conrad's attempts to find a qualified TLB driver are not going well. Training certificate, that's, that's not even your face. He's back in the driver's seat for now. We're digging a hole just to see how far the bedrock is. Down there, the bedrock is where the diamonds will be. While Don is keeping a nervous eye on the water level. I said my piece, and if they don't listen, so be it. This is not for sissies. This water is freezing cold. Guys are, are working heavy equipment. They're working very powerful pumps. In the water with snakes and possible hypothermia, breathing off of a pump, you, you need tough guys but I do think that they go too far on the other side. They drink far too much. Because the first few days they were in the water, pumping, drinking beer. Alcohol, using heavy equipment, you just don't do it. Try to keep it away from Don, and it's like, he's like our father figure, and it's almost in a way, it's quite fun. You know, you're doing it behind someone's back. It's lunchtime. Peter's decided to continue work. It was a low snowfall, it wasn't much. Unless we get surprised later on with a raging torrent down the river. Um, but right now, we're going to head north, we're going to head upstream. Try and find the bottom of the Letsang mines where the tributary hits the main stream and look for a spot where we can mine in the next few days. While Peter scouts the valley, Don drives down to see how much the water has risen. The divers are finishing up for the day. Gary has pumped far more bags than Warren. I'm going down, so I'm hitting the bottom. Um, he, he's trying to pump in on the rocks and he's blocking up all the time. My bags are all just big stuff. There's a little bit of friendly rivalry. 
Are we getting a bit bitchy? What? Ah, you fail. I think it's going to get bitchier. <laughs> As it goes along, we've all got a bit of tempers. I'm sure it's, uh, you know, island fever. While you're sleeping tonight, I'm going to give you a fucking Dutch oven, bro. Don is convinced the river is still rising, but he can't move the machines on his own. I had to stop because the guys couldn't keep up with the amount that I was pumping out. As it is, we've got enough stuff up at the house which needs to be checked for diamonds and that. The crew are leaving the machines where they are, and just as everyone goes home for the night, the river rises. Oh, shit. A little bit of a hurry. We're trying to get down to the machines. The water's rising pretty quickly. And we need to pull the machines away from the bank. So it's probably right, risen a probably another meter since we've left work, which is an hour ago. Uh, <clears throat> if you have a look, she's really got rapids flowing here. Normally there's no rapids. So she's flowing quite deep. The river rose. You don't expect it to happen so quickly that you're caught unawares. Yeah. We may have a bit of a flood through here tonight. No, look here, it's high already. And this whole thing's trying to get full. the motors above above the expected water level. They just don't listen. I told them at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock this morning to move the stuff. Now, at the last moment, watch out. At the last moment, panic has set in because the river is rising. Let's go some more. No, it's OK. Lower, lower. Lower. Here we go. Done. Down. Down all the way. Fantastic. The rain is our biggest enemy. As much as you can plan, one doesn't understand or expect the four seasons of weather you get here in the Lesotho Mountains in one day. But it was a bit of a panic, but all that ended well. And this morning is a beautiful, beautiful day. We got a fright yesterday about the, the speed with which the. No, who water would get runs. that fright? I mean, uh... you did because you weren't <laughs> listening to me when I said that snow is going to end up in our river. <laughs> right now, we're not even at bedrock, so we'll stay where we are try and get down to the bedrock and see if there's still anything. We're putting the units on the trailers, and if there is a problem, we can just hitch them up and uh, get out of Dodge. When we tested the pumps on the trailers last week, it's a big concern. They didn't work. They didn't work. There no, wasn't enough. Nothing, ha nothing has yes. changed. It was trial and error. We just kept trying different things. South African can-do attitude. All the guys, they put their heads together and uh, you know, cobble this together and that together, and the compressor was needed. And if we put a hose here, and then we put an outlet there, and uh, we'd got it all working. If you push the wrong equipment too hard in a very harsh environment, something can go wrong. It's not just machines being pushed to their limit. The altitude here plays havoc with your breathing, and you don't sleep because of lack of oxygen. One of our guys is recovering from cancer and he's been quite badly affected by the altitude, which doesn't mean he doesn't pull his weight. He's just weak. When it comes to work, then it's time to work. The job comes with everything that the job entails. You gotta go through a lot of rubbish before you find anything. We've got a week's worth of concentrate. I don't hold much hope for the area we're in. I think the water moves too quickly there. But the guys did say they got quite deep, so maybe, you know, we may be lucky. 
it's a bit of a waste of time to pump that. Now, if you thought finding diamonds was easy, then you'd have 50,000 people in this valley all looking. This is where the 100 carat cullinan will come out of. <laughs> no cullinan. This is like buying 500 lottery tickets and you look through each one to see if it's one and then it hasn't. Nothing. Wash sand with no diamonds in at a special price. We'll pay you to take it away. No matter what you can tell a person, when you see it, you believe it. You now you start worrying about, is this worth it? Did I make the right decisions in life? It can get your spirits down, I think, if you're not getting anything. There are. There's no doubt there's diamonds. We just got to keep looking. I'm not sure if we should even be pumping. We may be burning out the machines for no reason. I think this week's been a good learning curve for all of us, and maybe this was the best spot to learn. Let's haul this out now. Stop. From the, what the local people here have been telling us, it's further up. Here we are in the mountains with an ominously big river with millions of tons of sand. Knowing somewhere buried out there in those hundreds of kilometers of river, there's some little diamonds. How the shit are we going to find them? After the first sight yielded nothing, the locals had brought them to a stretch of river renowned for its stones. He was sipping a diamond by hand like this, like this. Then he got the diamond just here. And he didn't take a long time to do this. Where did he take these stones from? Here. Right here. Yeah, right here. Good news, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah. A lot of interesting white rock that comes from the top of the hill, eh? It's not from down here. If this is the tributary, then this is a very good spot. It's called by all the locals the hot spot. It's closer to basically the top of the volcano, but everything just seems different here. The sand's like silty and muddy. The new hot spot is very exciting, but it poses huge challenges. Before they can mine, Conrad must drive back to South Africa to collect the new mesh from Jan. The new mesh will completely change the nature and volume of sand coming through. I'm really excited about it. We're going to take TLB and we're going to start fixing the road so we can get into the new hotspot. Because I'm certain if anything's to be found, that's where it's going to be found. Coming from the outside world, if there's a river, there's a bridge across it. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, turn. That's not the case up here. The distance from the camp to where we're going is probably about five kilometers and we've got two rivers so we want to make dead sure we can get cars across here even when the water's a bit higher than this. Like yesterday, the water was way up my door. And they don't ask anybody to do something unless they can do it themselves. Uh, and later on we're going to go do another one. They work for hours alongside the, the local labor placing those rocks. It's a mission, eh? Uh, yes, you come here hoping to pump diamonds and you're spending 50% of your time developing the area so you can get to them. The rest of us all came with that attitude. We would do whatever needed to be done. I think the, the spot up there by the trees is a very good spot because if there's diamonds in this area, they're going to be there. It's full of this tick. Garnet is a sure indicator that this is blue ground straight from the diamond pipe. I think we've learned a lot. We've learned that we're in the right spot. That valley comes directly from the volcanic fissures that generate all the diamonds. And anything that washed out there hundreds and thousands of years ago is exactly where we're mining. Ready to rock and roll? This hole was actually dug by an old lady in her 70s, apparently, so all the locals say. Um, this is where they, she found it, like about a 100 carat stone in here. That's the proper garden, the glossy one, look. I think we can do better than a 70-year-old granny. Once the lure of the diamond is in your blood, it's always there. That lust to go after the diamond. Diamond hunting, it's a bit like a gamble. It's like going to a casino and it can consume you. Definite guaranteed diamonds being found right there. One diamond can't travel all by itself, eh? We're gonna find a diamond here, and that's just uh, such a cool feeling. Change our lives, everyone.
Who, who gets to do this type of shit? Next to arguably the most profitable diamond mine in the world. It was my intention to tell him that uh, his equipment has cost us two or three weeks downtime. When you were here last time, uh, but, uh, Ron, you didn't place the order, so don't When you were here, when you were last you time. Got a crazy switch and temper. Him dropping the rock on the back of my fucking legs. You want one? While he was down, I carried on hitting him and hitting him and hitting him. 